Thank you very much. It, uh, it's my pleasure to be here in sunny Cancun with all of you. And I knew when you all arrived because my instructions were, don't let anyone see you. And you all overcame us on the beach. And so I'm trying to hide out. And I said, OK, we'll, we'll sneak off to the pool. So it's nice to finally be able to be amongst all of you and celebrate with you in this wonderful accomplishments that you all have achieved. And so congratulations to all of you. And first of all, thank you to Nestle and Power Bar, who have been with me on this Olympic journey for the last seven years. Now this journey of mine in speed skating, it started back 23 years ago. Yes, when I was one, I wish. Uh, but it was the last 15 years that really were this journey where I had one goal, and that was to stand on the podium with an Olympic gold medal around my neck. Now I did bring my medals for you to be able to take a look at, but when I first started that journey, I looked at it like it was a ladder. And at the top of the ladder was that Olympic gold medal. And each step I would take, would be another step towards achieving that dream. Now in 1988, I moved to Calgary from Saskatoon uh, because I made the national team. And I started looking at each step was a next step to that final destination. Now I went to the 92 Olympics where I was 14th, which is right around where I should have been. But it was the 94 games that I really felt like it was my time to shine. I was ranked fifth in the world, and so I figured I had a chance to stand on the podium. Now, in long track speed skating, there are no heats, there are no semis, there are no finals. There's just a one-shot deal. I was standing on the line. I was paired with a German girl, Francesca Schenk. I was on the outer lane. And as we went down the first 100 meters, all you can think about is just what your goal is. That's it. You're just so focused on that one goal. And if you saw in the video the race where I crashed into the bumpers, that was my Olympic race. One-shot deal. And you go in there with this focus of standing on the podium. I didn't care what color of medal, I just wanted to stand on the podium. And you come out of there in last place. All you feel like is a complete failure. Not only to yourself, but to your family. Everybody had flown over to Norway to watch me. And to your team as well. That I was so consumed that I had failed, that this goal that I had, that I hadn't accomplished it. That I walked away from the Olympics and I thought, you know, I don't think I want to do this anymore. This isn't much fun. So I started seeing some kids and, and going to some schools and talking about Olympic experience. And you could just see them light up when they think, wow, you've been to the Olympics. And I realized that I had forgotten all of that. I had forgotten that I was a young girl who had a dream to skate my fastest. And I was at these Olympics, and I was so consumed with just my goals that I didn't even celebrate with my team when they had accomplished great things, that them helped me to get over what I had encountered. And I realized that you can become so focused on your goals that you put these blinders on, that all you see is straight ahead and you don't see anyone else around you. And I realized that I had this goal of getting to the top of this ladder. And I wasn't going to do it if I just walked away. And so I realized that I wanted to stay in speed skating. I had a passion for it. That's what had started me first in skating was the passion. That's what really drives us all from the inside. And I also realized that I had to change my attitude. I had to be less focused on just my goals. It wasn't a bad thing to have my individual goals. Ultimately, when we stand on the line, we're by ourselves. We're an individual sport. And yet we have this whole team of people around us, not just the other skaters, but the coaches and the therapists, our family. They're all part of our team. And every one of us, we have to realize that we can set our individual goals. But we have to realize that we have these team goals as well. So I got back into the sport, and I changed my attitude. And I, you know what? I had more joy, and I had more fun having that, that attitude and being able to share everything with my team around me. Now, heading into the 1998 games, we were the best team in the world. Everybody was expecting our team to walk away with so many medals. And we had just finished the World Championships, and we were at the press conference for the Worlds, and there was a reporter who was sitting there saying, Katrina, we think you're going to win the gold medal. And I said, OK. And I had been winning all the races up until the Olympics. And he said, no, we think you're going to win so much that you should just stay at home, and we'll send you the gold medal. And do you know that a little part of me wanted to write down my address and say, OK, thank you. Here, I, this is where I live. I'll just be waiting for that gold medal. But more of me thought about 94 and thought about what I had overcome, the obstacle of falling at one of the biggest competitions of your life. And I wanted to go to the Olympics. I wanted to stand on the line 
have my best race and be able to say that we did that as a team. Now, we had a change in our sport. There's always evolution in every industry. And in speed skating, we had the emergence of the clap skate. It's sort of like a cross-country skiing boot, and it's hinged at the front. Now, this was a huge change for us, and it sort of changed the way we skated, but we were skating faster than we'd ever skated before. So what they realized was because we were either inner lane or outer lane, there was a difference. So what they did was they gave us two races, two days apart. Now, as you all know, the Olympics are all about athletes, nothing about making money. But for some reason, this uh, new 500 meter format meant that they sold two tickets. Now, they were 24 hours apart. Both races counted towards the final uh, standing. So you had to have two perfect races. You couldn't sort of mess up on one race. The first day happened to be Friday the 13th that I was racing. Finished my race, waited for the rest of the women to finish, and by the end of the first day, I was leading by three one-hundredths of a second. Now, all year I had led by half a second. I had this big gap over all the other women, and here I was at the Olympics, three one-hundredths of a second. I finished my cool down, and people were coming up congratulating me, saying, you're, you're winning after the first day, that's great. I went up to the stands, and my husband and my coach and our sports psychologist, they were waiting for me, and they knew I wasn't happy. And I went up to them and I just started crying. And they said, why are you so upset? And I said, I don't know if I can handle this stress and this pressure. And they're looking at me and I can be pretty tough on the outside, but inside, it, the hardest thing for me is to, to let people see what I'm scared of, my fear. And what I realized is that I couldn't help myself by keeping that inside. We all have fears, fears of failure. And yet if we open that up and we allow the people around us to help us deal with it, it helps us overcome that. And so here I was saying to them, you know what? I've been involved in this for 20 years, but I don't know if I can do this. And Cal, our sports psychologist, is looking at me and he said, you know, tomorrow, Katrina, all of the other women are going to skate better than they've ever skated before. They're going to skate the fastest race that they've ever skated. I'm sort of looking at him thinking, Okay, you're a sports psychologist. I'm supposed to feel better after time to you. You're telling me the women are going to skate faster than they've ever skated. I'm actually feeling worse. And I'm sure he had this look on my face. And he was looking at me and he said, all that means is you have to skate faster. And he wasn't telling me anything that I hadn't heard before, but all he was saying to me was that when other people around you raise their standards, that means that you raise yours as well. And he was looking at me saying, why not expect the best from yourself? And I thought about it and I thought, I know how to do this. I know how to stand on the line and skate and technically I know what to do and we've done every bit of training that we need to do. Why not expect that for myself? And all he was saying was that the competition is a good thing. That just helps us bring the best out of ourselves. So I stood on the line the next day and we had the best race and we came away as, as a country of Canada with the gold and the silver and the 500 meter. Now, what happens in Canada when you win a gold medal? You get a phone call from the Prime Minister. Now, unfortunately, in Britain, you get knighted. So you're sir or lady. But in Canada, thankfully, we get a phone call from the Prime Minister. Now, I was preparing for my second race, which was the 1,000 meter. And I was going onto the ice, and all of our support staff had these, have these cellular telephones. Now, Cal, he had the phone, and there was a phone call from Jean Chrétien's secretary saying the Prime Minister would like to speak to me. So I waited and I waited and she came back on after a few minutes and said, well, I'm sorry, but Jean Chrétien, is, uh, he's occupied right now, we will phone back. So Cal said, you know, go ahead, you go do your training. Now I think his favorite moment of the Olympics was because while I was on the ice, apparently the secretary phoned back and she said, oh, Jean Chrétien is now available. And he got to say, I'm sorry, but Katrina's busy right now, you'll have to phone back. <laughs> So I think that was his favorite moment of the Olympics. But I, I was fortunate enough to skate the 1,000 meter and come away with a bronze medal in that event as well. Now when I came home from the Olympics, somebody came up to me and they said, oh, so you've accomplished everything this year. You've won everything you could ever win, so you're going to retire. And I said, no, I'm committed until Salt Lake City. And they looked at me and they said, oh, but you've won everything. You can't get any better. You can only get worse. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, that's true, but the next goal was, how could I stay at that level? 
Now, in Lance Armstrong's video, The Power of One, you've seen him talk about how to stay at the top. And for me, that was the goal. And for each one of us, in all that you've accomplished, how do you stay at this level? We live